Six weeks are up and the Rust release train is back on track. Welcome to Rust 1.72. Rust has this amazing ability to gate code conditionally behind feature flags. This means you can conditionally include code for specific platforms like Windows or Linux, but it's also very often used to enable whole features like the JSON feature in request for serialization of JSON or enabling formatting code in tracing that requires allocation. In our code, we can create whatever kind of feature we want. In this case, I've created a feature called awesome that I'm using in this library crate. And I've put this struct behind that flag so it will only get compiled into this binary or into this library if we enable that flag. If we run this code with Rust 1.71, we can see that it's broken. So we've tried to bring in lib my awesome struct, which is behind this feature flag that we haven't enabled. And then we tried to use it inside of main, which isn't as important right now. The error message we get from 1.71 is unresolved import lib my awesome struct, no my awesome struct in the root. So we've made the mistake of not enabling this feature that we need to reach this struct or this item. However, in 1.72, we get a nice little help message that says, note, the item is gated behind the awesome feature. And the error message includes that we found an item that was configured out. So basically it knows about items that are behind feature flags that aren't used in the current compilation so that it can keep those names around and supply them in error messages. So that's a nice little addition to error messages in 1.72. In Rust, when we say const, we mean that code is being evaluated at compile time. So if you define a function as const like we do here, then this can execute in a const context and be evaluated when we compile or run cargo build instead of when we run cargo run or execute our binary. With Rust getting more and more const evaluatable expressions in a standard library and more people providing them in general, it makes sense that some creative individuals would find ways to surpass the limits of the Rust compiler when evaluating const contexts. In this case, there was a limit on the number of statements that you could have in const context. In Rust 1.72, you're allowed to do unlimited amounts of evaluation. Here's some code that uses a const function to set up a const called nothing. We haven't specified this function to return anything, so it returns unit by default. Thus, the return value of this function will be unit for our const. It's notable that adding const to a function doesn't affect the runtime capabilities of this function. It just makes it so that we can use it inside of a const context to initialize a const variable like this. So that means this function is just setting up an infinite loop and executing it infinitely. Otherwise, this binary doesn't do anything special. It just print lines here if it successfully runs. If we try to run our binary with 1.71, we do get a compiler error, but that compiler error says exceeded interpreter step limit, const eval limit, which is the limit that we were talking about earlier. There's also a few other warnings that don't really mean anything and don't matter to us, like constant is never used. If we run the same code with 1.72, we see a different error message. Constant evaluation is taking a long time, and it points to our loop like before. This lint is basically here as a safeguard to make sure that you don't get yourself unintentionally stuck in an infinite loop, uh, but in our case, we intentionally created an infinite loop. So because we've intentionally created our infinite loop, we can allow long running const eval, and now when we run our const limits program, it just hangs because we're stuck building, as you can see on the bottom here, in an infinite loop. It just lets us evaluate forever. Now you still do get a warning, constant evaluation is taking a long time, but because we've enabled this flag, it'll let us run forever. So we do indeed get as much evaluation as we want, we just have to be specific about when we want it. Rust includes the concept of dropping values when they're no longer needed, such as at the end of a function. And implementing the drop trait on your smart pointers or your own structs can allow you to run logic when that value is supposed to be dropped. So in this case, when we drop the struct my numbers, which is just a wrapper around a vec i32, we run dropping numbers and the debug output. And if we run this program, we can see that my stuff, it gets created and then it gets dropped later in the output. Now our program here is constructing a my stuff struct, which is a regular struct with name and the struct my numbers as a field inside of it. That field is then defined as a vec of i32s. And then we implement the drop trait for that struct. So we construct, my stuff, numbers is a my numbers. We set an arbitrary index to the number seven just to prove that we can access this value. This will be interesting in a second. And then we call this drop numbers function, which we've defined and just takes ownership of my stuff, which drops it at the end of the function. So we print out the value and then we're done with it, which allows dropping numbers to execute. This code works in 1.71, like we saw, and 1.72, exactly the same. Rust also includes a struct called manually drop. Manually drop prevents the compiler from running the destructor automatically. So you can see our my stuff struct here is now a manually drop my numbers, 
and otherwise not much else has changed. We're wrapping manually drop around my numbers when we construct the struct, and otherwise this code currently is exactly the same as we had. If we run the code in 1.71 or 1.72, you'll notice that our drop function never runs because manually drop requires us to go drop the value ourselves. Now, manually drop is something that you are not really going to use very often, and its entire purpose is to prevent this drop function from running, automatically anyway. So if we want to make sure that we drop this value, we can call standard mem drop on value.numbers. But if we run our program again with 171, we can see that the drop function still doesn't get called, our drop function, the destructor. Now, if we run Clippy with 171, will be notified that the inner value of manually drop is not dropped when we use the drop function. There are two ways to get around this, one of which is to use the manually drop into inner function to get the inner value inside of the manually drop. So we've got a manually drop struct that is basically a tuple struct wrapping my numbers, and we wanna get inside of that manually drop to get my numbers to be able to drop it. And now with 171, when we run this code, we get our drop function back. So if we go back to standard mem drop, which remember we had to run Clippy to warn us about before, 1.72 now warns if you try to use standard mem drop on a manually dropped wrapped struct. And it specifically calls out that standard mem drop on a manually dropped doesn't do anything because it won't drop the inner value. Now there is another way to drop here, which is honestly probably the one you're going to use if you find yourself using manually drop in the first place. And that's using this unsafe variant instead of into inner. So inside of this unsafe block, we can call the drop function from manually drop, and we have to pass it this mutable reference to value.numbers. We also have a print line here to show why this is unsafe in the first place. But otherwise, this code is much the same. It's the same structs. We initialize the value with manually drop, and we call drop numbers on it. So we've only changed this function from what we were just talking about. So if we run this function in 1.72, we can see that the unsafe block successfully drops value.numbers, and actually still leaves us access to the original my stuff. And you'll see in our debugs that we have my stuff, we have the manual drop of my stuff happening here that runs through our drop implementation. And then if we print out the debug value for my stuff again, we get basically junk data in our vec. So if you ever try to use manually drop, be sure to make sure that after you drop it, that value is no longer exposed in your public API. That is why this is unsafe. Backing off a little bit, we have something a little bit lighter. The standard string module has these from UTF-8 unchecked, which is unsafe as well, and from UTF-8, which is a safe version of the function, to take a byte string and turn that into a string. So in 1.71, these string literals that we're creating here are invalid UTF-8. In the first case, because we're using unsafe and from UTF-8 unchecked, this is undefined behavior because we're giving it something that isn't UTF-8 and not checking that it's UTF-8. You can see when we print this out that we get a little like question mark icon in here. And then for the safe version, we are always, because this is a string literal that is invalid UTF-8, we're always going to get an error from this. If we run cargo clippy with 1.71, we are warned about this with the string literal. But in 1.72, we don't need to run clippy to find out about this, as those lints that check these string literals that we're passing into these from UTF-8 functions have been raised from Clippy into the Rust compiler. Similarly, if we want to compare against nan or not a number inside of an F32, so this is a value that you might get if you divide by zero or whatnot, and if you do nan equals nan, it still will be false. So in here, we've got a 2.3 as an F32, and then we test to see if that's equal to not a number. In this case, this will always be false because nothing can be equal to not a number. If we run cargo clippy on 1.71, we are, we do actually get warned about this. But in 1.72, we don't need to run clippy because this lint has been raised into the Rust compiler itself. I've fallen victim to this one in the past when moving a little bit too quickly, so I'm happy to see this get raised into the Rust compiler myself. The invalid reference casting lint that's now in the Rust compiler brings what used to be the cast ref to mute lint in clippy into the Rust compiler. Now, if we run this program with 1.71, this deny will get noticed as a unknown lint, so it's not known to the 1.71 compiler. But if we run cargo clippy with 1.71, we do get the older cast ref to mute lint. Now in 1.72, we have the option to enable this. But if we didn't enable it, we would still get the old behavior and our test and our program would just run. So what's going on here? We basically have let n equals five. So 
we have an i32. We pass a shared reference 2n into the function x here. So r here is a shared reference to an i32. We then take an unsafe block, which should raise alarm bells in your head if you've been writing Rust for any length of time. And then we have uh, something that you might not have seen, and we're working directly with pointers here. So we take r as a pointer to an i32. This is basically a shared reference. And then we convert that again, or cast it again, to a mutable pointer to an i32. So what's inside of these parentheses gives us basically a exclusive reference to an i32 that we can then mutate. So we dereference it with star and we plus equals one, which changes the value of n. So we've turned a shared reference into an exclusive reference that we can then mutate by fiddling with unsafe code and pointers. And this violates Rust's aliasing rules. So that's why this lint exists. You're not supposed to be doing this. Uh, instead, you're supposed to be using something like unsafe cell with interior mutability. Inside of the Rust C-O example that I have in this repo, we'll use uh, this kind of arcane incantation. You probably haven't run things like this before, but if we do Rust up run 1.71, and then we call the Rust C compiler on source main.rs, and we try to emit assembly or what the assembly would be, and we try to emit that to dash in 1.71, this results in a file called dash that contains all of the assembly that was generated by our program. In this case, it's just the print line. So somewhere in here, we should see the string hello world because string literals get included as string literals. And I'll delete that ASM file. But now in 1.72, things that emit text like this, like this ASM, or if you were going to emit a file or something like that, if you use dash, that prints the standard out. So now you can kind of build your own ad hoc tools that maybe processes the uh, assembly output of a program by passing it into another program without having to write out a file and then pull that file back in. There is of course a bunch more I could cover here like the initial support for native WASM exceptions as well as documentation updates and more. But I'll leave you with some news about some future Windows support that you should be aware of if you use Windows as a platform. Rust 1.75 will be the last version of the Rust compiler to support Windows 7, 8, and 8.1. Rust 1.76, which will come out in February 2024, so you've got, I don't know, six, seven months from now, only Windows 10 and later will be supported as Tier 1 targets. And that's it for Rust 1.72. Did I miss your favorite change? Let me know in the comments if so. And I'll see you again in another six weeks. Have a great rest of your day.